Um, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all and to welcome the, the, the organizers of this, uh, of this conference on a very, very important topic for the country and for Catolica, so the future of tourism. And I'm going to pass it on now to the, the directors of the uh, uh, tourism program, Nunu Fazenda and Pet Celeste. Thank you. Thank you, Celine. Uh... Now I have sounds again. Thank you, Celine. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar about the future of tourism promoted by Catholic Lisbon. My name is Nuno Fazenda, and I'll be your co-moderator along with my colleague uh, Pedro Celeste. We are professors at Catholic Lisbon and co-coordinators of Patch Tour, which is a program of tourism um, of tourism management for executives. Travel and tourism is one of the most important economic and social activities in the world. And tourism is one of the sectors most affected by, co by the COVID-19 pandemic. Thus, tourism destinations and companies now face a great uncertainty regarding the new consumer mindset and needs. To guide us with new perspectives about the future of tourism, we invited international and national experts we will talk about the future of tourism in different dimensions. So first of all, once again, many thanks to Sherry Mitchell, to Ligia Fonseca, to Chris Sig and Luis Araujo for accepting our invitations to participate in this webinar. And in fact, it's a great honor for us uh, to have your participation. We also would like to thank to all the participants. We have around 500 registrations and I guess we have now around 220 uh, on board at this moment. I have a few housekeeping items to cover about this webinar. First, today's webinar will be recorder, recorded and will be shared on Catholic Lisbon uh, websites. Next, we would love to hear from you during today's presentation. If you have a question for one of our speakers, please feel free to send it through the chat of the platform and please identify also the speaker with the question. At the end of the session, we will try to answer to them. Before I hand the mic over the, to Chris Sip, which is going to be the first speaker of this um, webinar to talk about the future of um, destinations, let me do a brief introduction about him. Chris Sip is a sustainable tourism specialist with over two decades of experience assisting tourism, conservation and development organizations. Chris Sik is the CEO of Solimar International, one of the world's leading sustainable tourism development firms that has implemented over 200 projects to totaling for 40 million in grants and contracts. Chris is currently assisting the national tourism authorities along with several UNESCO World Heritage Sites and United States DMEOs develop COVID-19 response and recovery strategies. Chris is also uh, an executive in residence and assistant tourism professor at the George Washington University and owns the Inn and Tavern at Minder, a rural bed and breakfast in Virginia, that he has led the strategy to reopen using a context hospitality program. So from US, from Virginia, uh, many thanks, Chris. It's now your turn. Thank you. Thanks, you know, It's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to be taking part in this important conversation here today. Um, as Nuna mentioned, I have the pleasure of working around the world to use tourism as a tool for economic development. And as Nuna mentioned, our industry has been hit very hard because of this COVID response. But now more than ever, it's important for the industry to unite together and understand what needs to happen together in order to recover. So I'm going to take you through a couple slides here to share some advice we're giving to destinations in the industry about how to recover and what the future is going to look like. So first, the question that we hear from everyone is this question of when will the travel industry recover? And unfortunately, we don't have a crystal ball that will say exactly when and how it will recover. So we're recommending people to take a scenario approach. This is from McKinsey Company, who um, wrote a beautiful blog article about the different ways in which companies and destinations should be thinking about creating scenarios in order to help 
think and predict what the industry will look like. So on this side, you have the differences between what might happen with the spread of the virus between being very effective to not effective at all. And down here, you're looking at the economic implications of, the, of this and what that means as well. So based on this, you start to chart out different scenarios that will help you either as a company or a destination start thinking about what, what will tourism look like when and how it recovers. Now, the other thing that I follow a lot of is what UNWTO, they put out some wonderful information about COVID, so I encourage everyone to take a look at their website. Um, they're also doing a scenario planning, and they're finding that based on when the easing of travel restrictions takes place, whether that's in July or September or December, we're looking at a dramatic drop in, in international arrivals and economic impact of tourism. So again, looking at this, and, and based on that, you're looking at anywhere between 850 million to 1.1 billion international tourists, almost a, over a billion to tri uh, almost a trillion dollars in exports, and then 100 million uh, jobs are at risk. So we all know the impact is, is pretty enormous. But one thing that's also important to remember is that tourism often rebounds pretty quickly. If we look at historicals from the SARS and our, our, our economic recession in 2008, the tourism industry tends to bounce back pretty quickly, but that's based on consumer confidence. And that's something we're gonna talk a lot about here today. Um, so what will recover first? The experts are suggesting that first, just people leaving their house and going to restaurants and shops, that's gonna be the first kind of recovery. And then people are gonna get in the car and take a road trip um, uh, on their own. And even you know, uh, public transportation might be limited in this, in this first phase. And then you're going to start seeing overnight destinations followed by week-long drive vacations. Then we're going to start seeing people flying and then international flights and then finally meetings and conventions. So it's thinking about that in your destination and your business where you fit in that. Now the good thing is we're seeing a lot of media articles that talking about travel. And I think the media looks at the opening of travel as kind of a, a sign that we're in the going in the right direction. So we're seeing a lot of articles about this, which I think is helping create this consumer demand. But when we travel again, it's gonna look very differently um, from everything from temperature checks at the airport to some places where they're actually doing COVID testing, um, like here in Dubai, before you get on the plane. When you get on the plane, the flight crew might look very differently. This is a, a, a flight crew from Qatar Airways who are basically dressed in hazmat suits. Once you arrive in China, they actually have restaurants where they disinfect people before they enter the restaurant. And then when they sit down at the table, you might have a mask, uh, a bag to put your mask in while you're eating. Or in this case, the restaurant actually comes in and disinfects um, your utensils and plates right there in front of you so you know that you can be safe. We're seeing a lot of people shift to contactless um, ordering, whether that's doing like this restaurant here on Instagram, or in my case, I was, had to, at my bed and breakfast, we had to create a whole online ordering system to allow it easier for people to order from their rooms. And in China, they even have robots delivering um, food to customers as well. Um, in Germany, you're seeing bars where they put up these different types of spit guards to protect the staff. You're seeing this in Japan, where in between, uh, on the same table, people um, protecting themselves. And then this wonderful cafe in Germany who makes people wear these hats in order to encourage social distancing at the destination. So what are the tourism industry recovery strategies? We recommend destinations take a three-step approach. So first is this question of respond. The second is restart, and the third is reimagine. So let me just take us through each one of these pretty quickly. First, respond. When this, industry ha when this uh, crisis happens, it's important that the industry and destinations do their part to share national guidelines and health and safety guidelines to keep people safe. Next, there needs to be a national testing and tracing. We can't uh, stress this enough. We've got to be able to track this. We know COVID, while we might have done a good job of stopping the spread, it's going to come back. We have to have these plans in place. I'm working with the country of Georgia right now, and they're doing some amazing things. But they knew that unless they had a t national testing and tracing program, there was nothing that their tourism industry marketing programs or, or cleaning can do unless they had this in place. And so they borrowed uh, a pretty substantial loan from the World Bank to do that. Also, it's important to help the industry with liquidity and making sure they have access to finance. My small bed and breakfast um, survived thanks to the release packages from our U.S. government when they passed these stimulus programs that allowed me to um, access funding to keep my staff on payroll. And then I actually just received a long-term 30-year 30, 30 loan at a low interest rate that's going to help me through the next um, few months, which is going to be very difficult. 
Also, it's important to create a social safety net to support the unemployed workforce because we know a lot of people are left out. And so how are we helping them? How are we making sure that they have access to income and food? And then also making sure we have a response plan for when it recovers, um, when re COVID returns. Um, this is the graph of the Spanish influenza in 1918. A lot of people are predicting that we're actually right here and we could see a spike here in the future. So what are we doing as a destination to learn from how we responded the first time around to make sure we're ready the next time it does come around? So now let's talk about something a little more positive is restarting. And I think this is what everyone wants is how do we restart the industry? And I think the most important thing is to provide clear, clean and safety industry guidelines, training, and even certification. Um, again, as a business owner, I need someone to help make sure I can tell the staff on my team what they need to do to keep them safe and to keep their guests safe. UNWTO has put out a great um, guidelines for this. I've also followed industry associations. This was here in the United States, the American Hotel Lodging Association has released a, a, a strong um, uh, uh, criteria as well. The World Travel and Tourism Council has put out its own guidelines, and they've even created a certification program that allows destinations and businesses to show that they're in fact following those guidelines. I actually have spoken quite a lot about um, Portugal's. I use Portugal as an example because I've read about this uh, clean and ready program and, and how that program was rolled out. And I think that's a wonderful example of what is needed in order to support the industry's recovery. And Turkey's even doing um, destinations as a whole. Um, another thing is the focus on domestic marketing. That's going to be the big thing right now. We have to recognize the shift. Ireland had a whole international marketing campaign ready to go. They shifted it to focus on the domestic market, encouraging them to visit um, and rediscover their destination. Um, the, also, the next one is these bilateral agreements for international travel bubbles. Uh, we started seeing this with New Zealand and Australia. Uh, we're now seeing them um, structured between different countries around the world. Europe is, in fact, leading some of these. These are really important because, again, it gives that consumer confidence that this is the right way to, to make sure I'm safe when I visit these destinations. And it's also important to make sure you have protocols or how you're going to welcome international visitors. Bermuda had to sit down and really think about how they were going to do this. And they require people before they come to get a COVID test and show that they, are, they haven't tested positive, make sure they have health insurance. And then when they arrive, they have to take another test in the airport and they have to quarantine for 24 hours in their hotel before they get the results, before they move on. These protocols are, again, important not only for the visitor to feel like they're safe, but it also is important for residents to feel that the visitors that are coming to your destination are not going to infect everyone. And then lastly, it's important to think about adapting your marketing messages. People now, the consumers change. We want safety, we want remoteness. Um, so pictures of large events with large concerts is probably not the way to go. Showing nature, showing the opportunities, my bed and breakfast, we had to completely pivot to show all the extra space you can sit outside and enjoy um, our little bed and breakfast. And then finally, the next stage is we talk about is reimagining. This really has given us a chance to rethink tourism. And I am encouraging destinations and businesses to not just rush to return to normal, but reimagine tourism and think about how you would like to see it change when it does return. And one of the things we're recommending is to strengthen tourism commitment to supporting conservation. We feel like that's very important. There are different ways the tourism industry can support conservation of natural and cultural resources. Um, here's a, uh, some of the models we use, but we think there's a great opportunity that as it comes back to really make that commitment strong. Second is we've got to avoid over tourism and we've got to improve visitor management. Before the whole COVID thing, this was the hot topic. Um, now we're rushing, we want the crowds back, but the reality is the day after the travel restrictions in China were lifted, this is the national park, 20,000 people arrived, they had to close the park by lunchtime. We need to have strong visitor management um, guidelines and systems in place to avoid these types of overcrowding, not just because it's a bad visitor experience and it puts stress on our resources, but it also puts our people at risk. And then finally, we also have a chance to listen to residents. Let's listen to our residents. Let's make sure that we understand what was their concerns with tourism before and make sure that we're bringing tourism back in terms that addresses their complaints with the industry. We all have seen these pictures and we know of destinations who've gotten frustrated with tourists. Let's make sure that when we do welcome it back, we do so uh, making sure that we keep the residents' um, concerns in, in mind. So in conclusion, we're recommending following a three-step process. First, respond, keep everyone safe, employed, and businesses going. Restart the industry safely, but also strategically. 
And then finally, reimagine tourism to improve the visitor experience and better support conservation and community livelihoods. Thank you very much. Happy to answer any questions at the end of the event. Thank you so much, Chris. Great presentation. Uh, I should also say that Chris is a good friend of Portugal. He has already done some work to the Douro Valley and the Porto. So many thanks, uh, Chris, for your presentation. Now we are going to start with the second speaker. Uh, Pedro Slecht is your call now, please. Pedro, we, I, we can okay. hear you. Okay, I'm done. So, good afternoon. My name is Peter Slerst and uh, as a coordinator of PASHTUR, uh, Advanced Program in Tourism Management, I'd like to thank our guests for their availability to participate in this webinar. I also like to thank all the participants that joined us on this event. Well, uh, I'm very pleased to announce the next speaker, Ligia de Fonseca from IATA, the International Air Transport Association. Ligia joined IATA in 2017 and she's actually manager in the member and external relations uh, department. She accumulates this role with being IATA's acting country manager in Portugal. On one hand, Ligia covers external relations subjects such as aviation environment, taxation, accessibility and policy making in the various aviation areas representing IATA in working groups in the United Nations World Tourism Organization and in the European Civil Aviation Conference. On the other hand, she serves as country manager for the seven Portuguese IATA member airlines, being IATA's institutional point of contact with the Portuguese government, the Civil Aviation Authority and all the other aviation and non-aviation stakeholders in Portugal. Ligia has well 13 years of experience in the airport transport sector and nine years ago worked with the Portuguese Ministry for Economy as an aviation advisor and later on the Portuguese Civil Aviation Authority where she was member of the administration board. You are very welcome Ligia and the floor is yours. Thank you so much Pedro. Let me try to share my screen first. I hope it's working. Can you please confirm? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So thank you all first for, for inviting me for, for this webinar. Uh, there is a series of, of webinars that Catholica is organizing and they're very interesting. So I advise you all to, to follow. And thanks for inviting Ayata to be present in discussing this, the, the future of tourism. In my case, I will take you on a journey into the future of air, air transport and what it's being called now the new normal. All of you have heard this before, the new normality. The first thing I want to, to show you is what we had in the past and how are things right now. So I chose this slide because I wanted you to retain a mental picture of what changed in terms of air transport. I wanted you to see here on the left hand side the, the number of flights we had in 2019 in, in May and then to compare it with the 1st of May in 2020. So you can see that although we have some, some dense areas uh, in red, it, these are domestic flights. So it shows that in terms of international flights, the, the difference is massive between the two reality, realities. We have a whole new reality. In fact, um, worldwide flights, are down by 70% when compared to the 1st of January this year. But we see the curve slightly taking off as from uh, the end of April, which is a good sign. We can see here the, the, the comparison, the breakdown in terms of the, the behaviors in the different regions. It, you can see uh, Europe in yellow. So, this drop in traffic of course coincided with the border closure in many countries with lockdowns imposed and of course with passengers fear of traveling this is another um, graph that shows that uh, air travel is expected to rise in 2021 but uh, it will be much lower than the levels we had in 2019 
in terms of revenue for the airlines, for the airline industry, only by 2023, around 2022, 2023, we will have the same levels of revenue experienced in 2019. If, it, if we compare global GDP and the, the revenue the, that the airlines had in the past, they were proportionally increasing and even converging in 2019, but then we saw a huge drop in, in aviation that is now slowly taking off and expected only to be back to those levels in 2023. This all is based, like Chris well said, in passenger trust. Consumer confidence is critical now to achieve these numbers again. Uh, given this scenario, so IATA ran a survey and asked passengers, once the, the pandemic has subsided, how long will they probably take before resuming their usual travel plans, be it for leisure or business? And the answer is that 70% uh, of the respondents said they would wait between one and six months, which is massive, before going back on an airplane. On an airplane. And as you can all understand, air transport and all the activities that air transport supports, like tourism, cannot wait six months. So this compared with the previous survey that IATA, IATA conducted in the beginning of the pandemic, where passengers said that almost 60% of passengers said that they would be willing to travel immediately or in the next one to two months. So 60% in the past were willing to travel almost immediately. And now we have plenty of passengers waiting a bit longer before going back to an, air, an airplane. That's why we need to regain passenger trust. As Chris also said, so I'm not spending a lot of time on this, uh, domestic flights will take off um, first and then the international flights. And what we will see is that the domestic fares will go down and the international flights will, uh, fares, I'm sorry, will be more or less the same. Something also very interesting is that if before almost half of the passengers would book with 20 or more days in advance their flights, Nowadays, the purchase of the few flights that are uh, being uh, flown are purchased, you can see in the graph, um, almost 40% of, of those flights are being purchased with zero to three days in advance, which is contributing to, to the airlines having less visibility and it absolutely distorts uh, any capacity or capability of the airlines to foresee and adapting to the consumer's profiles and demands. So this is a matter of urgency because aviation drives economies, as you know, creates employment, enables trade, facilitates health care and emergency aid, as we have um, all, all witnessed in the past few months. And of course, it connects people, business and economies. And this, this is what brings us here. So how will the new normal look like for air travel and for tourism? There are a lot of dimensions uh, from governmental and health organization policies. Uh, cargo is taking off. We have new operations uh, in place for airlines itself. But I wanted to focus here on something that probably interests all of you specifically and personally, which is the passenger experience. How will I be affected as a passenger in my experience while flying on an airplane. For, so, so to start with, you will be uh, facing a temporary biosafety measures in place, let's say in layers to create uh, a safety net um, that is dense. So you will have all the layers that you see on your screen from pre-flight to uh, border and customs and transit and because there is no, let's say, silver bullet solution, IATA recommends this temporary multi-layered approach during this restart phase, not only for passengers, but also for crew. And this is also to ensure that air travel is not a vector for COVID-19 transmission. Of course, we want to reassure passengers that they will not either get infected or infect anyone on board if they, if they uh, are. So IATA foresees that some additional passenger information will be collected before traveling with more detail on the passenger, on his uh, health information, health condition, and of course, always in line with privacy, 
protection rules. Um, we also follow and recommend the UN Agency for Civil Aviation, it's called ICAO. So ICAO's recommendations say that between passengers and governments, the information should be passed directly in governmental portals. And from those governmental portals, the information will be extracted and distributed only to the stakeholders that need it. So the check-in will also be different for you. Passengers will complete as much as possible their processes at home. They will print their own electronic uh, bag tags, their boarding pass. The idea here is for you to have the, the less contact possible with any surface at the airport. In the airport, all the, you'll have, for instance, as Chris also show, temperature screening at tent reports. You will be asked to maintain physical distance. You'll be asked to wear your masks. You will see the whole, a whole different new scenario at the airport. You will not be used to this, but this will become your new normal. And of course, you will um, not only get used to it, but recommend it and impose it to people with you. Also, the airport process will be much quicker because most of the process will be contactless or biometric and will not require interaction between humans. You will be asked to, to do your self backdrop and so minimize uh, interaction with any staff. When boarding, also you will have a more orderly um, boarding and the, the, the areas, the boarding areas will also be very different from what, we, what you have in mind right now. You need to, to, to try it and to, to start to be used to this because it will be a very new experience to you. And you will use self-scanning, once again, biometrics in many airports, which will allow you, allow you to, to feel more safe and comfortable. In flight, you will have you, you know that uh, evidence, uh, health evidence has shown us that transmission on board is really, really, really low. And this can, can be, um, this can, can be due to seat orientation, now to wearing masks or the vertical cabin airflow, the, those filters that everyone talks about, the HIPAA filters and the airflow that is vertical in the airplane promote the air circulation to be um, up and down and not in the direction of other passengers around you. At the arrival airport, the, you will have temperature screening in many of them and you will have trained staff to assist you if needed. In border and costumes, you will, also, you will also have electronic declarations. Everything will be on your phone as much as possible to to optimize your travel experience and also to minimize the contact with other people. This layered approach that IATA is promoting is um, outcome-based and is scientifically uh, based. So for all the risks that were assessed, we came with the best solution to do this in an agreement with the airline industry. So this is an industry proposal that is being made and this is the best solution, not only for the industry to, to take off, to restart, but also for passengers to feel comfortable and safe during their journey. So safe travels to all of you. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to, to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Okay. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, Lydia. Very interesting and powerful presentation. You gave us very strong insights for the next future regarding your area of specialization. Now Nunu Fazenda will present our next guest, Cherie Mitchell. So it's a great pleasure for me to present our next speaker that is going to talk about tourism operations management in the new normal. Cherie Mitchell is the president and founder of Immersa Global, an upscale DMC that specializes in creating exclusive travel programs and small meetings for discerning American clients. Immersa Global was recently awarded the most unique culinary tour operator of the year by Lux magazine. Mitchell has traveled to 40 countries and lived on three continents. She has two bachelor's degrees 
and a master's degree in Spanish literature and linguistics. Mitchell is considered a thought leader in highly curated travel as well as in extended solo female travel. She has over 15 years of experience in this area and speaks regularly at industry conferences throughout the US and Europe. Most, most recently, Cherie has developed projects that use tourism as a vehicle to connect cities in her native Florida with cities in Portugal at the municipal and national level. She's from US, but now she's in Portugal. And so Cherie, once again, many thanks for being here with us. The mic is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. So let's get the PowerPoint set up. Um, share screen. Okay, great. Good afternoon. My name is Sheree Mitchell. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. Uh, we're going to talk about um, tourism operation management and the new normal, a term that we're all probably getting used to now. So I just want to have a little guide for the presentation today. We're going to touch on four different elements, a brief overview of Immersa Global to give you context of what we're going to talk about when we get to the considerations for return to travel, and specific changes that we would make today if we were running programs with our clients, and then final observations. So Immersa Global, as mentioned uh, in the introduction, is an upscale DMC, and we offer different types of products that we curate and also execute ourselves. We are B2B and B2C. If you were to look at our client profile, you'll see that all of our clients are exclusively from the US. Average salary uh, is about $95,000 a year. In many cases, we have um, two salary earners in, in the homes. The age range is between 35 to 70. They take about two trips a year. Each trip, long haul trip, is about eight days long. Uh, the price point for the majority of our eight day programs without air is $4,000 per person double occupancy. Uh, our clients have about two to three weeks per year of vacation time. Remember, we're talking about the US and not Europe. There's a big cultural difference there. And the majority of them tell us that they have no time whatsoever to plan travel nor desire. So they're happy to delegate that to someone else. And they are always looking for authentic, fun, exciting, and new adventures. And luckily, Portugal is a destination that can offer all of that and more. So we don't consider ourselves a luxury um, DMC or luxury travel company in the U.S. because luxury is defined differently in different markets around the world. So in the U.S., we just be considered high-end or upscale. However, we do define the new luxury as the ability to enjoy a curated experience without ever thinking about the logistics, which speaks to our clients as they love to be taken care of uh, and not necessarily have to think about any of the logistics of their trips. So return to travel considerations. And of course, we're in a very dynamic moment right now. So everything is constantly changing as uh, the other panelists have mentioned already. Uh, I like to refer to the return to travel flow chart where we have uh, four or five different elements to consider to remind us where we were, where we currently are, where we're going, and hopefully where we'll end up in the next two to three years. So we had our pre-pandemic phase, which was where we're able to just perpetuate or continue our strategies that we had before because we had unprecedented growth and we were looking forward to having that growth in 2020 as well. And then the pandemic hit and we went into hibernate phase. Uh, the next phase, which uh, is where many of us are now, is in recalibrate. We're looking around to make sure that uh, we're still in place and that our suppliers are also still in place. We know uh, just by the nature of this situation that there will be some attrition in the market. Then we move on to post-pandemic phase two, which is stimulate. That's what we're all really wanting to get to as soon as possible. And then um, a couple of years out, hopefully we'll get back to accelerate in the post-post-pandemic phase. So with that, I believe that we're in uh, this area here and hibernate, recalibrate, and stimulate, somewhere between the three. So the three considerations, main considerations that I have for return to travel. Travel confidence, as the other panelists have mentioned already, which is really important. Traveler safety, safety is equally important. And then changes to policies and contracts that will help to support the first two. Traveler confidence. 
Uh, we need to identify key points of concern. This would be our, our pain points for our clients. Uh, reconnect with suppliers or source new suppliers in the event that we've lost some of our suppliers along the way, which will naturally happen, unfortunately. Collaborate with suppliers to address the client's concerns as best as possible. Quality assurance testing, uh, if your DMC or your uh, retail agency does such. And then communicate the product effectively to the client. So identify key points of concern. Uh, one of the tools that we're using at Immersa Global is a back to travel survey. Uh, a month ago, it may have been considered tone deaf to ask your clients or future clients to fill out a survey about travel. But now we feel as though we're at a point where we can start to have the conversation. And luckily, because we're such a high touch company, we stayed in touch with a lot of our previous clients and uh, we have a community of hopefully future clients as well. So some of the questions that we ask them, what concerns you the most about travel post quarantine? And here we have questions about the experience in the airport or perhaps experience in flight itself, uh, the possibility of having to quarantine when they return back to the US, um, which is always a possibility. Lodging, what's your preferred choice of lodging as this has probably changed uh, over the past three to four months. People are considering uh, maybe smaller properties or maybe they're considering private villas or private apartments within the destination. Uh, dining, along the same lines as lodging, what are your preferences now? What would make you feel most comfortable? And then we have a question that may seem a bit awkward, but you probably understand why we ask. We also ask, what sources do you follow for news regarding global health concerns? Right now, the U.S. is going through a bit of a polarizing moment. So it's always good to know where your clients are getting their information to be able to uh, properly package your, your, your message to them. So we take this information and then we collaborate with our suppliers to address the specific concerns. We do our quality assurance testing. And then we move into the most important part, which is communicating the product effectively to the client. Now here I have a very simplified version of the supply chain. Uh, our local suppliers here in Portugal, tour operator in this case, Immersa Global in the middle, and then our clients, either B2B or B2C back home in the U.S. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed is that with all, all these wonderful programs that are coming out, clean and safe, specifically here in Portugal, and then I believe there are other countries that are, are, are considering doing similar, pro having similar programs, safe travels, which is, you know, a regional program. Our clients back in the U.S., they do not know what these programs are unless they're in trade, the trade, to, uh, travel and tourism. And the majority of them are not. So we are looking for creative ways to connect the information provided from safe travels and clean and safe to what our clients do know. The CDC, the Center for Disease Control. So they're very familiar with the standards and protocols that they're rolling out. The FDA, Food and Drug um, Administration. OSHA, and of course, the U.S. Embassy here in Portugal, which luckily, luckily, I just checked today, if you dig a little, you can uh, find a page that links back to Clean and Safe on Tourism of Portugal's website. So that's always a really good sign for us to see that connection being um, um, supported by the U.S. Embassy here in Portugal. So we serve as, obviously, a communication bridge between the two countries, the two cultures, and we're looking for ways to make sure that our clients are getting the update information about what's happening here in this destination. So when it is time for them to travel again, Portugal will be top of mind. So traveler safety. Uh, one of the things that we're working on is creating ways to get the clients, the travelers to buy in on what their responsibility is supposed to be and how they're supposed to manage that. So in the case of Portugal, the hypothetical, if we had a group of clients come over today, we know that in Portugal, we're still using masks in closed, in, in closed places, correct? And this probably will continue for quite some time. Well, there's a different um, procedure taking place in certain markets in the United States. And so we want to make sure that our clients understand what will be required of them here and that they will be on board with that so that we could prevent situations of having uh, anti-maskers travel to Portugal and not have a pleasant experience because things are a little different, done differently here than they are back in their home states. And if that were the case, then we would just simply suggest to them, maybe this is, isn't the time to, to visit this destination. We also 
uh, communicate all of the measures and protocols that are taking place at the hotels, restaurants, and with our ground transportation partners. This way we are able to um, help them understand what the expectations are, as well as make sure there are no surprises whatsoever. That always helps in building, obviously, um, consumer confidence. And then on a back office thing, we have contingency plans in the destination. So this is the first time we've ever considered having to reach out to medical facilities here in Portugal and just establish contacts in the unlikely event, hopefully unlikely event, that we would ever have to refer clients to um, hospitals here. Changes to policies and contracts. So we're gonna see two slides where we're talking about changes to policies and contracts for two different groups of people. This is strictly DMC to local suppliers. So this is all in Portugal. We need to revisit the flexible cancellations, uh, refunds, and we need to revisit rates and deposits. All of these things have changed. The way that these things are managed have changed in the past three to four months. Uh, we still have some suppliers who are wanting to use their 2019, 2018 contracts. And we are uh, as diplomatically as possibly trying to tell them that we think that we need to renegotiate this because this isn't gonna work in the new normal. Relevant services and amenities. So the, a very quick example of this could be if breakfast is automatically included and the contracted rate, which it is in most European hotels, uh, if our clients are no longer wanting to take their breakfast at the hotels for whatever reason, then maybe that's an element that we need to go back and renegotiate and ask uh, if we can uh, revisit a different scheme. Liability for negligence of health and sanitation protocols by suppliers. This is very important because obviously we want to make sure we maintain a very safe environment for everyone involved. But this is extremely important for us because our clients are all from the US and the US is a very litigious country. So we wanna make sure that our suppliers here are doing exactly what they're promising that they're going to do because those same protocols and procedures that they're telling us that they're going to abide by are what we're going to put in our contracts with our direct clients back in the US. So speaking of that, changes to policies and contracts, this would be DMC to um, our business partners, uh, either the retail travel agencies that are sending us clients or the direct groups that we're booking with. Once again, going over flexible cancellations and refunds, rates and deposits, because before our contracts with them mirrored our contracts with our providers here. So all of that has to be revisited. Mandating proof of traveler's insurance with specific coverage. Now this is a new item that I think is going to be a hot topic in our industry. Uh, before we did not require that our clients had um, health insurance, traveler's insurance when they, when they traveled with us. And so we are in conversations with our attorneys back in the US and how do we write this in? Is this something that we can make uh, obligatory for our, our clients to travel with us. Testing group members prior to travel, which is also another hot topic that we're, we're mentioning in the U.S. If you have a group of clients who are coming from different markets, New York, Florida, uh, San Francisco, all around, when they arrive to the destination, if they're not testing in Portugal, and in, in, currently they're not, uh, do we need to have them tested prior to arrival? Whose, response, whose responsibility is that going to be? Will we as the incoming um, uh, tour operator be held liable if someone shows up that is infected and infects other people? Also liability for clients who become ill during the trip. So these are also conversations we're having with our attorneys and at this current moment, it's inconclusive. We don't have a definite answer uh, as to who will be held responsible and liability for negligence of health and sanitation protocols by suppliers, as I've gone over uh, in the previous slide. So with all of that said, uh, if we were to have a group come in uh, today, a hypothetical group, these are some of the changes that we would have. Uh, our general changes is that we would not contract spa services at all. Uh, the winery visits, we would work with our winery suppliers, and when we have groups, and our groups are usually about uh, 12 to 18 people, we buy out the wineries. And so we are the only groups, the only clients are at the wineries at that time. We will see if it's possible to work with the wineries using the Wine Institute of California's protocols, their procedures and protocols uh, for safety measures during COVID. And a lot of them um, align with what um, the Center for Disease Control is saying, and to be honest with you, a lot of them are also in line already with what um, clean and safe and safe travels is, 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 is uh, requiring or suggesting. 
But one of the activities that we would completely eliminate for now would be the grape stomping activity, which is one of my favorite, unfortunately. We would also have to take out the farmer's markets visits for obvious reasons. Uh, the private cooking classes would be out. The chef's table experiences, which is one of our clients' favorites when they get this one-on-one -on -one time with um, either a Michelin starred chef or a rising Michelin starred chef, those would be out. And the local VIP appearances where we connect our clients with um, well-known members of the Portuguese society would also be out. So final observations. Um, I think I'm running out of time, so I'll just show you these really quickly. These are different sources that I'm consulting either on a daily basis or on a weekly basis just to see what's going on. As we've mentioned before, this is such a dynamic moment. Things are constantly changing. We want to stay in touch with the clients. We want to stay in touch with trade. We want to stay in touch with our suppliers as much as possible. Um, luckily, the New York Times uh, for about two months into COVID, they were positively highlighting Portugal and all of the great work that, that we were doing here in Portugal. I can say we because I live here now. All the great work that we were doing here in Portugal uh, got a lot of coverage by the New York Times. And we saw that reflected in our clients' comments to us, either via social media or emails to us like, wow, you guys are having a really good run with COVID in, 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 in Portugal. That's going to be one of my first destinations to visit when, we, when it's safe to travel. So um, staying in touch with all these different outlets and just keeping a pulse on what's going on. I'm at the 15 minute mark. So if you have a chance, uh, please do visit the Welcome Home to Portugal video on YouTube so you can get a, a taste of what Immersive Global does here in Portugal. This is obviously a pre-COVID video that we, we made. And if you ever like to reach out to me, you can find me on LinkedIn and everywhere else on social media or send me an email at sheree at immersiveglobal.com. So I'm going to turn the floor back over to the moderators and I'll see you guys during the Q&A. Thank you. Many thanks, Sheree, for your uh, presentation. Great uh, insights that you gave us, uh, not only about uh, tourism operations, but also for the companies, for destinations, for authorities. So great presentation. Many thanks for your contributions and great uh, in insights. And it's also good to know the, and have your feedback about uh, the image that Portugal has abroad, uh, namely in the in in, in US. It's uh, it was a very good uh, insight, namely the, when you mentioned about the New York Times. So it's it's good to know. Now uh, I pass the word to my colleague Pedro Celeste to present our last speaker, my good friend uh, Luis Araújo. Thank you. Thank you, Nuno. Great presentation, Sherry. Many thanks. Uh, it's my great honor to present the next and last speaker, Luis Arouge, with whom I had a great pleasure to work with in different contexts and moments. As many of you probably know, Luis is president of Tourism de Portugal, the Portuguese National Tourism Authority, since uh, 2016. Previously, he was a board member at Group Pestana, responsible for the Hispanic America hotel operations, Argentina, Venezuela, Colombia and Cuba. He was also head of development for the same continent and head of sustainability since the creation of the department in 2009. He also has a degree in law and Luis, it's wonderful to have you here. We are excited to listen to your insights and contribution. Many thanks. Thank you. Well, and uh, thank you, Pedro and Nuno and Celine for the invitation. Great, great being here. You forgot to say in my resume that I'm, I'm the only one who doesn't bring a presentation. So I'm sorry. I'm just going to speak. So I'm going to stick to the five minutes <laughs> or less. Um, but, but it's great to be here. And thank you so much. Uh, I took many ideas from Chris and Cherie and Ligia and Ligia presentation. Um, I'm going to talk about, a little bit about the future of tourism in Portugal. Uh, at least it was my, my task right now. And I really enjoyed what I saw from Chris, the first part respond, uh, the second restart and the third reimagine. I'm not going to talk about the respond part. I think we're much more oriented into the future right now with, with the challenges and, 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 and the big hopes that we have for the tourism activity in Portugal. Um, and focusing on, on those two areas. Um, but we do have to look uh, a little bit to, to the backside. And one of the biggest advantages that we see over this period 
uh, was one, uh, we are used to management, uh, to managing crisis in Portugal, that's for sure. And the second one, it's really useful to have a strategy. We launched our strategy in 2016 until 2027, uh, focused on sustainability and centered on people. Uh, and this is still the basic thing when we think about restarting or reimagining an activity. If we focus on people, and in the strategy of, of the tourism sector in Portugal, we, we focus on the workers for the activity in tourism, on the tourists itself, and the residents, the citizens. If we still focus on that and we stick to that, any measure that we take to the future and the restarting and the reimagining will always be successful. And um, thinking about this and about this re new restart, we really focus on three things. The first one is trust, something that we have spoken a lot here. Um, and when we talk about trust, we always talk about trust regarding tourists. We forget that now more than ever, we need trust inside our country. We need trust for many people that have invested uh, during many years in this sector that have had great results and are now facing uncertainty for, for the future. Uh, trust based on sanitary measures and, and health measures, um, doing massive tests, being very clear in the communication that we have, what we are doing in, in the entire country, uh, all the rules and the clear rules that we have accessing different activities like restaurants or beaches or whatever, uh, but also trust for the business trust for so many entrepreneurs that have developed new businesses in Portugal from local lodging to uh, travel agent to tour operators. So this is clearly something that we want to reinforce um, and the clean and safe stamp was one of these measures, uh, building trust in both sides, both tourists and the sector inside the, the country. The second one is responsibility uh, and when we talk about uh, something like the COVID, uh, we can't talk about issuing regulations or imposing people uh, some activities without talking about responsibility. And it's not just a responsibility from a, a collective responsibility, it's an individual uh, responsibility. It touches all countries, all citizenships, all nationalities, it doesn't discriminate any country or any person. And uh, um, we've been focusing uh, and we had a purpose, we have a purpose as Tourism of Portugal, uh, as well as the tourism activity in Portugal, which is welcoming everyone and respecting the differences. And now more than ever, we have to stick to that purpose and show the world that this is the right way to work or to restart our activity. Um, going back to the clean and safe and when we, we talk about responsibility, uh, we thought that this was the best argument to convince uh, not only the companies telling them what they needed to do in order to be prepared for the future and for the new clients, because we do have new clients with new demands and new worries, um, but it was also uh, a clear message to the sector, to the tourism, to the tourists, national and international, that they needed to have a responsible uh, activity or responsible um, visit to our country. Uh, that's why we launched two weeks ago a digital platform, um, a platform called PortugalCleanAndSafe.com, where any tourist can evaluate if a, a certain restaurant or hotel is complying or not complying with what they say they would comply in order to prevent the spreading of the virus. So we have a green, a yellow and a red dot. And if they, uh, or if any of us goes to a restaurant and we think that we're not complying and the restaurant is not complying, then we just have to press the red button and we do an audit immediately. So this is uh, a second uh, area that we're really focused on in building responsibility and giving clear communication on what Portugal is doing to the entire world. The third one has to do with experience um, and, and, and clearly uh, I think Ligia and Cherie have spoken about that. Uh, tourists now, uh, we're very much focused on a seamless experience. Uh, 
the area of not touching things, that's something completely different. But when we speak about payments, mobility, check-in, uh, information, we need more than ever to, be, to have a seamless experience inside our country. We've been working on that through the Innovation Center, the NEST. But we do think that this is the third uh, uh, big block that we have to work for the restart uh, of, of the activity. Talking about reimagine, I couldn't agree anymore. Um, I think we do have to reimagine our activity. We do have to focus on what's essential. We do have to focus on people and the planet, both of them, and uh, just uh, let go of anything that is not inside this, this focus. And I would say that here, uh, I'm talking a little bit about the future, uh, I would start with innovation, uh, searching for new segments, new needs, uh, new ways to do business, um, new ways to share knowledge, and this is really important. And I think what, what we're doing here and what Catholic is doing here and many universities in Portugal are doing is, is, is quite a big example of what he, which we can do for the future, for the entire world. Um, and I, I would just want to give you a small fact. Um, our 12 uh, tourism schools in Portugal have given online training to more than 40,000 people these past two months. 40,000, 40,000. The incredible part of this is that the smallest schools, the school from Coimbra or Vila Real de Santo Antonio, gave more training and more successful training than the big schools from Lisbon or Porto. This is the real uh, innovation and this is how big Portugal can be and I think this is something that we should stick on and, and, and try to promote this to the entire world. Uh, and talking about innovation, we also had a very good news today. Portugal has been considered today from the Commission, from the European Commission, uh, inside the group of strong innovators inside the European Union. We came from moderate innovators to strong innovators. We only have Sweden, Finland, Denmark, N the Netherlands and Luxembourg in front of us. This is amazing. And I think this is something that we should uh, all be proud, but most important, we should all take advantage of this and promote this to the entire world. The OECD has a ranking with more than 400 um, innovations uh, against COVID in the entire world. Portugal has almost 10% of all of them. Almost 40% of these innovations are made in Portugal. Uh, so I would say that innovation is clearly a way to go for the future of tourism in Portugal. The second one is diversity. Of course, diversifying markets, um, fidelizing our clients, uh, partnership uh, with, with companies, with startups, with, with other destinations. Uh, also, uh, I think it's, it will be crucial for our activity for, for the future. Uh, and the third one has to do with technology and sustainability. I do think, uh, and we do consider uh, in Tourism of Portugal, that technology is the best friend of sustainability. Uh, it, it allows us a better knowledge of what we have, uh, a better planning on the future, um, a better uh, and most precise activity for our companies. Uh, we need to reinvent the way we do business, the way we communicate, the way um, we understand and make our companies more efficient. And I do think uh, uh, that technology and digital will be crucial to this activity. And I believe very strongly that Portugal has a role here, not only in terms of tourism, but very much focused in terms, in terms of tourism. So um, to be very uh, brief uh, and thanking you once again, uh, we're very focused on trust, building trust, uh, responsibility, and uh, giving the best experience in these turbulent times to anyone that comes to Portugal or any Portuguese who is inside our country and will now discover different parts of the country. Uh, so thank you uh, very much and I'm glad to answer any question. Thank you very much, Luís. Uh, uh, we need slides. It's a great presentation. Congratulations. 
uh, I think it is always important to share positive insights regarding the future, moreover, in this particular moment. And I'm sure that uh, your reflections will contribute to reinforce the mindset of the Portuguese tourism operators, agencies, and, and partners. Outstanding moment, thank you very much. Um, now, uh, we have more or less 15 minutes of opening session where our speakers have the opportunity to answer some of your questions. And I'm sure Nuno wants to be the first one. Okay. So let's start with uh, with Chris, our first uh, speaker, and um, have your brief two brief questions. First of all, is uh, if you could share with us what destinations should do to remain to, to to reinvent the tourism in this new era uh, of uh, in the new era of tourism. If you could share with us like three four points, and I also would like to know to have your opinion about uh, the image of Portugal in the US. Uh, Sheree already shared with us uh, her point of view and I will also would like to have your perspective about the image of Portugal uh, in this context that we live today. Thank you. Absolutely. Chris. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, you know, for the reimagining question, um, I've been following what New Zealand's tourism industry has done and they really uh, were the ones who kind of introduced this idea of taking a chance to rethink the way tourism and the director of tourism there actually went around the country and hosted listening sessions with local communities to get their understanding what are their concerns what would they like you know because a lot of communities are, are a little apprehensive about welcoming visitors back so just starting off by listening to residents listening to industry and and being able to show that they're really dedicated to trying to address those issues so i think that that's one and then the visitor management is another one i've been working with parque sintra with UNESCO through the World Heritage Journeys Program, um, which is uh, visit worldheritage.com with National Geographic and UNESCO. And we've been talking with World Heritage sites about how we can look at ways to really in, uh, integrate these visitor management strategies um, so that we can space out or look at time ticketing. Um, those are all important to look at at this time, um, especially in light of COVID. And then in terms of the question of, of Portugal and the United States, I, I think that before COVID, Portugal was this rising, kind of um, destination that everyone was excited about. Um, you know, obviously I, I follow the travel industry very closely, but a lot of people in the US um, were talking about going to Portugal. You used to hear people say, let's go to Europe and they would do the grand tour, but increasingly you saw people saying they want to go to Portugal by itself. And I think the efforts that you've made to really respond to this crisis, I think is going to help strengthen that. And, and I think that you're going to continue to see a, a quick recovery. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much for your insights. Pedro, do you have any questions? Yes, I have a question here for Ligia. Uh, Ligia, um, let me ask you a difficult question if you don't mind. Okay, uh, let's do it. Sorry. <laughs> when we talk about the world of aviation, we are naturally concerned with the next future. Uh, since tourism is divided into two major markets, such as business and leisure, uh, we can expect that the new world is coming up, particularly in business markets. So in this case, we are expecting many changes in the way meetings, conferences and events will take place in the future. So how do you think the authorities, airlines and travel agencies could work together to create value in this area? Sorry. Well, very tough question indeed, Pedro. Well, but it's a very interesting question. And we, we all know that uh, aviation travel is divided into two big segments, leisure and business. And for the majority of us, uh, we continued working electronically. So we may think it's easier to continue using platforms like this for business to continue as usual, which is not exactly true. But let me go to the other side, to the other segment, to leisure. So it's not the same experience being in a beach with hot sands and the smell of the sea or watching a video. So we are expecting travel, leisure travelers to take off first, to be the first ones to, to start traveling. But we could, let's say we need to keep in mind that businesses are based in trust and in personal relations. So it's we foresee that business travel will continue to, to take off probably 
after the takeoff of, of leisure, but it will. And of course, in promoting business travel, this needs to be a common effort from chambers of commerce, from the trade associations, from governments and the airport industry in this common goal. But I'm sure I'm very positive that this will continue to, to happen in the future. It will start maybe a bit later than we wanted and we will expect it to, to happen anyways. Thank you, Pedro. Okay, okay, Lizia. Mm -hmm. Sorry, have you one more question now to Sherry? Uh, and, um, and the question is uh, what uh, uh, Portuguese companies uh, and um, Portuguese destinations should adopt uh, in the current situation to satisfy uh, the needs of your customers? Uh, as we know, they are uh, customers in uh, a, perhaps with uh, more uh, specific uh, um, requisites. Uh, so this is one of the, the questions that I would like to, to, to do to you. Thank you, Sherry. Well, the good thing is that I think a lot of companies here in Portugal already know what to do because you guys have been doing it and you have been very successful at attracting um, certain type of segments from around the world, not just the U.S. And so if we're able to find a way to make this the safest country, it's already the best country to visit for the past three years. If we can find a way to make it the safest country to visit, I, th I think you're going to um, be light years ahead of a lot of your competition. Um, also, making sure that we're not losing our authenticity, right? Um, which has always been in the back of my mind, a bit of a concern as we are seeing all this amazing innovation, which is great, we need it. We just want to make sure that it's not pushing out the main reason why many people want to visit Portugal in the first place. So um, balancing our, our innovation, making this an extremely safe, it's still a very welcoming country. And I'll add one more thing that a lot of Portuguese don't realize. Luis alluded to it, but I'm not sure if the majority of you know that you have one of the most welcoming countries in the world. You have one of the least racist countries in the world. People from around the world feel happy and welcomed here, and that's really important. It's the reason why I made it my home. Uh, so if we can just continue to focus on the strong points or the strengths that we already have and that we, we have perfected or in the process of perfecting, make it safe. I think that you have all of the marketing elements that you need uh, to be in the position where you want to be at the end of this year, the beginning of next year, and so on. Okay. Thank you. Um, um, I have a question for Luis. Uh, Luis, let, let me ask you some practical questions and insights. Um, tourism represents nowadays more or less 20% of the Portuguese GDP. And many small and medium sized companies have experienced in the past few years a wide range of opportunities in this industry. For many of them, that evolution represented a unique moment that Portugal lived until the beginning of the pandemic time. Okay, so we lived a moment of extreme positive insights when this happened, and probably this moment could generate a pessimistic perspective of the future. That way, uh, what kind of message and recommendations will you announce to these companies based on the fact that they should even create more value to the customers at the same time they have to embrace the digital challenges. Okay, thank you, thank you, Pedro. Well, um, we, li we lived a very good moment and a wonderful moment in Portugal for the past five years. Um, just to give you an idea, in 2015, we had uh, 11 billion euros of revenues from the tourism sector in Portugal. 2019, we closed with 18.4, more than 60% growth in four years. Um, this is uh, a proof that our country deserves this, that our companies uh, give the best experience to any customer, that they are focused on the customer, all that. 27 million guests in, in 2019, 10% uh, of the employment, uh, so many sectors that have grown thanks to tourism. Uh, we've seen from shoe shops to wine producers saying that without 
tourism, their activity is turned into almost zero. Um, and, and this is this is a very big responsibility for a country because we've been supporting these companies and stimulating these companies to bet on this activity. And this is the activity that is more damaged with the COVID. But all our assets are here. Uh, we still have our people, our landscapes, our monuments, uh, now with less people, so much easier to visit. Um, everything is still here. Uh, our people uh, and our, uh, everywhere in the country is eager to welcome everyone. So I would say that uh, if we have all this here, and we're working on rebuilding the airline activity into our country as well as into the entire world, then we are back. And our role is to keep the same work that we were doing for the past years. Um, how can we create more value to our customer? I think that is a question. Um, of course, digital is a great mean or a great vehicle. I, I see it as a supporter not uh, uh, as an, uh, a contradiction. Uh, what I do think is that we have to focus more and more. Uh, and, and I'm proud to say that Tourism of Portugal, we will focus on this much, much more. We have to focus on people and the planet. Uh, if we want to reimagine an activity like tourism, we have to focus on these two people, the workers, the tourists and the citizens uh, and the planet finding ways and and i think uh, this is the biggest challenge that we have in front of us when we see a new uh, activity when we see uh, a new demands from customers uh, uh, the return of the single use plastic uh, new procedures or equipments that are being implemented that in a few months will worth will be worth zero or uh, very close to zero uh, this is this is worrying so we should take this into consideration and evaluate all this, the new demands of the customer and how can this sust be sustainable to the planet and the people. Um, and I, I truly believe that Portugal with our track record, with our companies, uh, some companies with more than a hundred year old activity, with people that have been tr be trained for this for the past years, I truly, I truly believe that we are much better prepared now than we were a few years ago. And, and if we focus on this, people and planet, we will surely be successful once again. Okay. Thank you, Luis. Okay, Nuno. We have some questions from the audience, uh, at least three questions. Nuno, can you... Yes, I have, I have here one... Uh, one question to, let me check, to Ligia. And, um, and one of, the, the, one of the, the participants asked us, asked to Ligia, um, that one of the major difficulties uh, um, in certain destinations is, regard, is related with the COVID tests uh, that they need to do. Uh, and uh, there's, there is no enough information of about what kind of tests they should do. Uh, do you have any information regarding this? What kind of tests uh, the passengers need to do in some destinations? Yes, and thank you, Nuno, and thank you for, for the audience for, for making this question. Very good question. So as you can imagine, this is very volatile because in one day, the conditions, the health conditions in a country are one and then the following day are totally different and the government adapts and adjusts to that, to that reality. And they may be requesting a test on the following day that they were not requesting the previous day. So to address all these questions, IATA created a dashboard online where you can check for each country what are the measures being imposed at it. And that, um, this, this uh, dashboard is being updated more than 200 times a day to make sure that every information there is accurate. So if you have any question related to what is being imposed, what kind of measures, am I being quarantined when I uh, get to the destination, am I being tested, etc. All of this is in the uh, IATA Travel Pulse in our iata.org website. 
people can check this immediately and see what they need to prepare to at their destinations and also after they go back to their uh, departure country. So this is a very good question and it's a very informative tool that everyone should use because it's very accurate. Thanks. Thank you, Luigi. Uh, I have a question from Domingos Felicio to Sherry Mitchell. Uh, it says that uh, travel uh, assistance insurance needs to be changed to ensure reimbursement to passengers in case they test positive for uh, COVID-19. In the United States, do insurance already cover this or not? That's a great question. The majority of the insurance companies that offered uh, travelers insurance to travelers uh, did not cover. We will see what's going to happen moving forward. Um, there's no definitive answer on that just yet. I think everything's up in the air to be decided. It's inconclusive at this moment. I wish I had more information, but it's such a dynamic um, and changing world that that's the best response that I can provide right now. Very good. And I have a final question from Joana Pascual to all speakers, but uh, I'll put the question to Luis or uh, to Chris. Uh, how can a historical destiny also rich in nature that had millions of visitors per year now come back with so many bad news nowadays with COVID numbers rising? Where should we start? Wish. Sound wish. Can you activate? Okay. Yes. I didn't I didn't get the first part of the question. How do historic uh, 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 I, I repeat. So how can a historical destiny also rich in nature that had millions of visitors per year now come back? with so many bad news nowadays with COVID numbers rising. Where should we start? Well, that, that, that's a very good question. Uh, we should start with facts. Uh, and I think that's a very good starting point. We have more cases because we are testing more. We have more cases because we are testing more because we want to know where people are who are infected. And we can uh, ignore that and just say that everything is perfect. Uh, and not take care of our health and our economy. But we have decided that that's not the way to do it. Uh, and uh, the way to do it is, once again, building trust, uh, sharing the information that we have, telling the world that not a single of our hospital is, is crowded. We have less than 60% occupancy in our intensive care units. Uh, we're testing more, yes, we're finding more, uh, but that's the way we want to do it because we find that that is the only way to do it uh, in a positive way for our locals because we're worried with their health, but we're also worried with, uh, with the health of anyone that comes to our country. So I would say that it's a matter of communication and it's just a matter of, of, of uh, building uh, a strategy on top of facts. Okay. Very good. So, Nuno, I think uh, we have all the questions the, the audience wants yeah. to, to share with us. So, uh, I think is it's time to, to end this. Okay. So, before Pedro, you finish just to once okay. again. I'll say a few words uh, before uh, our dean. And I say that uh, in the name of Catholic Lisbon School of Business and Economics, I'd like to thank you all for this amazing moment of sharing and discussion with the contribution of very competent and great professionals. Thank you for your enthusiasm and thank you, Nun Fazenda, for being my colleague in, in Catholica and a friend as well. Many thanks to the audience uh, and to their relevant questions and I'm sure you all enjoyed it. Finally, I hope this webinar will represent the starting point to create even more value on the tourism challenges. It was a pleasure being here with you. Thank you very much and all the best. I'm sure our Dean wants to close this webinar and share some final words with you. Flip, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you, Pedro. Um, I, uh, I think this was a wonderful conference. Um, uh, the digital conferences of Catolica 
uh, are meant to provide knowledge of the situation, learning among each other, um, and to achieve uh, collective impact. And I was listening attentively to all of your uh, insights and presentations, and I, and I learned a lot. And I, maybe I would like just to share a couple of minutes of some of the things that I took away from, from the seminar. Um, one is that it's clearly uh, we need uh, a different approach to management in times of COVID. And we need to go back and we are going back to something that was in vogue in the 70s, which is managing in times of uncertainty, scenario planning, and the uncertainty can be so high, the volatility is so high that we need to have a strategy, but one that, that is robust to quick changes in, our, uh, in the situation. Um, and the scenario planning approach was developed in the 70s to, lead, to help people lead with the oil crisis. And it was forgotten as a, a management approach for almost 20 years. Uh, it was all about disruption and, and growth and innovation. And now I think it's back in, in vogue and, and, uh, and we saw some interesting scenarios about what the future may bring. Um, also, uh, I, I, well, it was interesting from Cree's presentation, his statement about we need to be ready when COVID comes back. So it's not a question, will we have a second wave is how strong it will be, when it will arrive, and how we can have a robust strategy to be prepared. Um, it was also interesting, clearly in the first stage of the confinement, we had a very blunt approach, which was let's all go home, lock ourselves up, lock the economy to stop contagion. And that worked, but at a huge cost. Now the approach is much more nuanced and it's the, the layered approach, I think that Ligia mentioned, which is we cannot have one measure that works, but that kills the economy. We need a series of measures, all of them may be small in the way that they reduce the impact of COVID, but they have a small cost and they change behaviors and the accumulation of all those small measures, all of those certifications, all of those practices will actually give us an effect that's similar to a confinement, but with much less economic uh, and, uh, and societal cost. So that's the approach. That's the approach that has been, been developing in tourism, in other sectors, and that's what we all need to do. That involves responsibility, individual responsibility to start with, also collective responsibility. And the key issue is, is returning the trust. I think the trust was the thing that everyone mentioned. We need to return trust associated with individual responsibility so that each one does the measures, the safety measures that are necessary. Um, I think we also spoke uh, and Luis made a powerful call for sustainability and for the fact that as we reimagine our worlds, we cannot go back to the world before. We need to, uh, to reimagine re a different world uh, that's more maybe customer oriented even, uh, that speaks more to the needs of, of the customers and the clients and to the sustainability for the planet. Um, so overall, it was a great set of insights.